What's up everyone, Dylan here. I wanted to hop on and do another episode of the weekly analysis video. In this week's video, we're going to begin right where we left off last week, kind of get into what has happened since the last upload. And then going forward, I'm going to talk about some key areas to look at in terms of technicals going forward. Uh, so with that said, we'll hop right into it. So at the 16 minute mark of last week's video, I went over two key technical areas to look at, right? One was on the NASDAQ, which at the time was the weaker instrument. And then the other key area was on the Dow Jones, which at the time was the strongest instrument. So let's get into that. So I covered this key area on the NASDAQ because it lined up with both a previous swing low and the anchored VWAP from um, the mid-January lows, okay? I said that the bull's main objective is to hold that. The inability to hold that will set up for a 170-point decline to the demand structure where potential support lies, okay? That is exactly what we saw happen, right? Price came down declined right to that demand structure, and that's exactly where the NASDAQ bounced last week uh, after I had made the video, and uh, basically that was the low of the week, okay? So hopefully some of you guys followed that or at least looked at it. Um, so what went down for the market, uh, for the NASDAQ to sell off like that, right, since posting that video? So the following day, which was Wednesday, a few different things happened that caused that uh, sell-off, right? On one hand, you had disappointing earnings from Microsoft, Google, and AMD, okay? You also had banking concerns um, from uh, New York Community Bank, uh, which reported an unexpected $252 million loss in Q4, right? The, uh, the ticker for that one is NYCB. Okay, you could see, uh, you know, on a weekly chart, it absolutely plummeted to lowest levels um, in, you know, over 20 years. Okay, so uh, that kind of rekindled some concerns for regional banks, right? The KRE index uh, ETF. Um, so that caused some bearish sentiment. Um, on that front, I personally don't think. Um, it's too much to worry about because it seems to be very specific to that bank in particular, as opposed to being a problem where contagion, you know, uh, contagion problems uh, may occur. Um, so uh, I would assume that other people would agree. Hence, you know, why, why we kind of backed away from that area, right? It wasn't a widespread problem. Um, we also had the um, Fed decision that day as well. Powell pushed back on the uh, March rate cuts. Um, so it was a little bit more hawkish than people had expected it to be. And, you know, those uh, combination of events caused the move lower on Wednesday, right? Price precedes news. Uh, NASDAQ came down and hit that exact demand structure that I outlined, and that is where we bounced. Now, did I think we were going to bounce there? Yes. Did I think that we were going to bounce all the way back up to previous all-time highs in just three days? No. That definitely caught me by surprise, and we're going to get into why we are now back up to those highs. Okay? So, um... Uh, one other thing that I wanted to kind of go over is my lack of execution. So I highlighted that demand structure in last week's video, and I also highlighted a key area in the Discord. Um, both areas basically marked the lows for NASDAQ, yet I did not capitalize on either one in terms of me actually putting money behind the trade idea. Um, so last week was not a good week mentally for me. Um, you know, rather than dwell on the past, I'm going to, you know, come into this next week very focused and, and uh, you know, with a, a clear roadmap. Um, so I wanted to kind of go over that other key area as well. I highlighted this um, 14,000, 
six, uh, what was it, four, 17,466 area, right? Uh, because it was a key area uh, where price has pivoted in terms of support and resistance in recent times, right? You had key support there going back to January 26th and, and the 28th. And then you also had um, key support there as well before the Wednesday decline right into that demand zone. So once we broke out of that key area, uh, I was expecting the retest to get bought right at that 17,466, right? I, I uh, highlighted it here on February 2nd. Bulls ideally want to defend that 17,466 area. And then I also commented how uh, the the S&P was also above its 50% um, uh, Fibonacci. So as long as it stayed above that 49.15 area, bulls technically were in control. So you had S&P above the 50% retracement and the NASDAQ um, get bought right at that uh, key uh, pivotal area, uh, you know, in, in terms of support and resistance, that was a clear sign that bulls wanted higher prices in, in plain English, right? That's That was the clear sign that the momentum still favored uh, the bull side. Um, yeah, like I said, I personally did not catch either move. So um, a little bit of a bummer there. But, um, you know, I'm at the point now, um, I've been doing this long enough to understand that um, it is impossible to catch every single trade or every single move, I should say. Um, however, when I have you know key areas outlined, such as the ones that I just went over, and I lack the execution behind them, uh, that's when it becomes kind of a problem, right? It's one thing to call out different plays, but it's a totally different ball game to actually you know have the mental capacity to put money behind these um, you know uh, plans and and actually put risk on the table. So uh, like I said, last week was not s good for me. And uh, going forward, um, you know, we're not going to dwell on the past and, and get focused uh, for, for the near term future. Um, so in, in plain English, ever since the last time I posted the video, NASDAQ came down to a key area, which at the time was the weaker index. So when you see the weaker index bounce at a support area, that is a good sign, right? Because technically, um, if the weaker index can bounce, that means that the stronger indexes will uh, also be able to sustain value, right? Kind of uh, just a, a general uh, rule of thumb. So not only did it bounce at the demand structure, it also made, it continued to make higher lows on the way up, right? Then it had that really clean breakout. We're gonna go over why that occurred. And then on the retest, it got bought up again. So clearly the bulls have control in the near term, okay? Now, I have been telling you guys that I personally would not chase recent highs, okay? I still stand by that. That technically was a 3% decline right into that demand structure where it got bought, right? So I still favor, um, if you want to buy, right, the market, I still favor doing it on dips as opposed to chasing new highs. I'm also gonna get into different pieces of context that further support that uh, thesis of mine, okay? So I still stand by the point in saying that chasing, uh, you know, near recent highs or, or all-time highs, uh, it's just not ideal from a risk-reward standpoint, okay? So what caused this crazy rally to the upside in tech? It was favorable earnings, right? Amazon and Meta specifically had crazy uh, good earnings, right? Look at this meta chart. It's crazy. This was actually record breaking. Um, uh, it was the most market value any U.S. company has ever gained in a single day, according to Bloomberg. It's ironic because Meta also holds the record for the the biggest wipeout in history, too. Uh, so I thought that was kind of funny how it holds the most market value added right in a single game and the 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 the, the biggest wipeout also in history um so 
they had very, very, very good earnings, right? The company also announced that it will be paying uh, out a 50 cent per share quarterly dividend for the first time, which is very incentivizing for new, uh, you know, cash flows to come into the name. Uh, and they're also planning a $50 billion share buyback. Now, was there any way to predict that? No. In plain English, anyone who tells you that they knew that that was going to happen is full of S-H-I-T, right? Unless you're neighbors with Mark Zuckerberg and you guys happen to, uh, you know, kind of go out and get your mail at the same time in the morning. And he said, hey, you know, Dylan, you know, by the way, I'm uh, planning to do a $50 billion share, you know, buyback and, and offer a 50 cent uh, per share dividend, right? Unless that occurred chances are no one knew that that was going to occur. So uh, it's a crapshoot, right? Um, it could have been the total opposite where Meta and Amazon and Apple, uh, you know, totally had blowout earnings to the downside and we would have seen uh, the market come off much more. So um, when it comes to earnings season, especially when the mega cap names, uh, you know, report, it's, it's really, really difficult to have an understanding of where the market is heading next in, in plain English. So, um, like I said, Meta and then Amazon also had a very, very, very uh, good, um, you know, earnings report. So, that's what caused such a large um, surge in 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 terms of, uh, you know, how the, the NASDAQ managed to get all the way from this demand structure all the way back up to, um, you know, near that, that those all-time highs. Same with the S&P. The S&P actually broke previous all-time highs and made new all-time highs on Friday. So um, the opportunity cost of not chasing highs uh, was missing out on this further extension to the upside. But like I said, I'm totally fine with that, okay? On one hand, um, earnings were a crapshoot. I didn't know that Meta and, and Amazon were going to have crazy solid earnings and, 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 you know, rip stocks to the upside. Right? I didn't know that they were going to have such a big effect on the NASDAQ and the S&P and, and, and uh, you know, cause S&P to make new highs, right? And like I said before, uh, I've been in this game long enough to understand that no trader is going to catch every single move. So I don't mind, you know, that small opportunity cost, right? I still believe that um, it is better to buy, uh, you know, dips uh, at key areas. And we will talk about some key areas going forward um, uh, as opposed to chasing highs. So I still stand by that. Um, so what is next? Um, I wanted to talk about um, the dollar, okay? The dollar surged, okay? Not only did the dollar surge on Friday, um, the, the, the overall indices, right, the S&P and the NASDAQ, really what were not affected, which I um, did not think was going to be the case. I was under the impression that the S&P and the NASDAQ were going to uh, struggle to sustain value, especially the following day after Meta and Amazon reported earnings. Um, I was under the impression that the S&P and the NASDAQ were going to kind of pull back uh, and, and as opposed to having uh, the ability to sustain that rally. Yet, the opposite happened. Um, so S&P ended up continuing to surge uh, with the NASDAQ despite the dollar index breaking out. So I was wrong on that assumption. Let's talk about it. So if we go to a daily chart, this is a very bullish breakout. On one end, you have an inverse head and shoulders uh, breakout above the neckline, which is this um, uh, downtrend resistance. So I'll draw what I'm talking about. All right, so you have a... Um, this head and shoulders, right? And this was spotted by uh, KPAC on uh, Twitter. I think his at is uh, KPAC82. Uh, he's got some good good charts on there. Uh, I, I personally did not spot this, uh, this uh, inverse head and shoulders, but um, you know, you could see that Friday's move clearly broke out of that structure. 
the reason the dollar index, inc you know, moved higher on Friday was because of the uh, non-farm payrolls. They came out uh, close to double what was expected, uh, which triggered a uh, increase in yields, right? If you go to TNX, you could see a massive move to the upside um, in the 10-year treasury note yield, right? So when you have the DXY go up, you also have yields go up as well. They, they correlate uh, hand in hand. So usually, when you have a large breakout in the dollar index and, and yields, those will put pressure on, um, you know, the NASDAQ, Russell. Um, and you could see that um, NASDAQ was really not affected. It, it continued to surge on Friday and managed to close right near the high of day um, on, on Friday. Whereas the Russell was in fact affected. So the Russell ended up closing Friday um, red. Um, and, you know, it was, uh, you know, kind of uh, the, the dollar index breakout kind of put a lid on uh, the Russell. Um, so it's very, very, very interesting to see um, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ be able to remain resilient despite rates, uh, you know, having a, a big move to the upside. Um, so in plain English, the lesson from Friday, um, I, po I posted it in the Discord. The lesson from Friday was, where are we? Uh, right here, lesson of the day. DXY breakout is important to follow. However, when the tech sector has incredible earnings in some of the mega cap names, it makes the DXY context a bit less significant, right? When NASDAQ dip got bought right at the 17,466 level and bounced hard, that was an indication hinting that bulls still had momentum to move higher. Bottom line, tech strength outweighed the dollar index strength. Both the S&P and the NASDAQ are mainly comprised of tech weighting, so when tech names are strong, chances are that indices will see continuous strength. So, um, like I said, that caught me by surprise in plain English. And that was the key lesson of the day on Friday. Um, however, if the dollar index continues to the upside, as well as rates continue to the upside, you know, in, in a prolonged manner, uh, you know, at some point that is going to start to weigh in on, uh, you know, the overall market. Um, you know, Friday could have been um, kind of like an outlier because, like I said, it was following um, excellent earnings out of Amazon and Meta. Um, so definitely keep an eye on that. And, and this kind of uh, is this idea is supported by RSP. So RSP, I've gone over on this channel before. It's the uh, S&P 500 equal weight ETF. So the S&P is comprised of 11 different sectors. And RSP shows you um, the price of the S&P 500 if all of those sectors were equally weighted, right? Um, you know, the normal S&P, right? was seen breaking to new highs, right? Look at the divergence between this chart. Let me get rid of that line, right? Look at this chart in, in recent days, right? Clear uptrend, especially over the last two days, whereas uh, RSP has been going sideways. Why is that? It's because RSP is not overweight in tech names, okay? We're also at a key area on RSP, which is this supply structure. Right, this supply structure over here that was established in uh, April of 2022, we're struggling to break above that. So not only is it struggling and it and it continues to move sideways, it's being done at a key area in terms of technical analysis structure. So if that starts to break to the upside, it is bullish for the overall market because it will show that there is a broader, um, you know, rally. Uh, taking place. However, if if SPY and QQQ continue to the upside and, and RSP moves sideways or down, you're just not getting 
uh, that broader uh, market breadth um, support, right? That's something that we've been going on, you know, over on on this uh, on this uh, channel. I also wanted to talk about S S five F I, right? Which is S five F I. This is uh, a trading view. Uh, no S five F I. This is a trading view ticker. Um, and essentially, anytime it gets to that 92 area, it fails, right? Ever since uh, 2021, it's gotten to that 92 area. What this um, displays is the S&P 500 stocks above the 50-day moving average, okay? Now, we're not looking at penny stocks here. We're looking at the biggest names in the United States, right? The, S, the, the stocks that are comprised... Uh, or the the index that is comprised of the largest stocks in the, the United States, right? The, the 500 uh, big stocks, right? So this chart shows that since the new year began, right? In January, January 2nd was the first day of this, of, of since hitting 92. Since this new year began, 30, about 30% of the stocks in the S&P 500 have declined below their 50-day moving average, yet SPY and QQQ continue higher. What does that mean? That means, like I said, I've, I've talked about this in the past. That means that a very small amount of names are leading overall sentiment, right? So at one point, there was the uh, Magnificent Seven, right? Uh, comprised of Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Tesla, Nvidia, and Meta. Okay, now they're starting to say significant six because Tesla has been underperforming. Tesla was in magnificent seven, but uh, you could see it's it's been uh, struggling, right? Whereas look at uh, Microsoft, right near all time highs. Amazon, very very strong in, in recent months. Um, Nvidia just made all-time highs on Friday, and then Meta, new all-time highs. So you have, you know, six names that are freaking outperforming and really, um, you know, doing a lot of the work in terms of overall, um, you know, S&P and NASDAQ, right? This shows you, this, 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 we could see this, like I said, in RSP, it's moving sideways, it's not breaking out, and then the freaking S5FI as well, right? We're seeing overall 30% of S&P stocks decline despite these other names continue higher. So definitely keep an eye on, on uh, those significant six, right? Uh, Tesla, I wanted to kind of go over this uh, area that I am personally looking at. I haven't decided if I'm going to put bids there yet. Um, but this is definitely an interesting area um, that I think might produce, um, you know, a, a potential move, right? So, um, let's see. Kind of go like this. One sec, let me redraw that. We have this channel here, all right? Let me extend this a little bit. So, we have this channel. It's not perfect, but... All right, right around here. We have this channel that it's been respecting since July of 2023, right? We have two tests to the upside and then two tests to the downside, right? And it kind of just goes from up, down, up, down, up, right? So it's making lower highs and lower lows. If and when this bottom channel gets tested again, let's just say in the future, it tests down here at like 174, that could be an area of support. Like I said, I personally have not decided whether I want to long just solely off that information, but as time gets closer, um, I'll have a better idea. Um, so that's definitely a key area to look at going forward. In terms of the S&P and the NASDAQ going forward in, in, in the near future, we want to look at the 50% retracement from recent highs to lows. Um, so 49.32, technically, the, S or the bulls have control over that, that, um, that level, okay? Because 
there has been such a uh, aggressive rally to the upside between uh, the Wednesday lows and Friday highs that uh, that. 50% 50% area is going to be um, important to kind of gauge uh, relative strength and weakness. Okay, you can do the same in the NASDAQ, right? From top to bottom, uh, lies at 17,498.5. So essentially, if you find areas to buy uh, above that, um, they have a better chance of getting bought. Um, if price is uh, does not uh, hold above there and, and declines below that, you might see um, some added uh, sell pressure, right? Uh, I also wanted to cover the VIX, right? The VIX, which is very interesting, has been making higher lows despite the S&P also making higher highs. That's a divergence. That should not happen. What should happen is if the S&P makes new highs, the VIX should either either go sideways or decline. So the fact that it's slowly been making higher lows, um, you know, um, it's, it's definitely something to watch. The higher the VIX goes, the more pressure gets put on the S&P. And the more pressure that gets put on the S&P uh, makes it more vulnerable to declines. Okay. Um, so definitely look at those in the near term. Um, and then uh, if if those 50% uh, retracements get breached, uh, let's just say on NASDAQ, um, we might get a test down in this area um, before that breakout occurred, which lies right around uh, 48,000 uh, or 4,800 95 ish on, on the S&P. So um, uh, definitely look at that area as well. Um, but I'm probably going to hop on here again between, um, you know, now and next week. So um, we will definitely, uh, I'll definitely continue to um, map out key areas going forward. Um, so that's about that. Uh, that's about it. And um, I'm going to cut it there. If you guys enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up or feedback. Everything's very appreciated. And uh, if you guys have any, um, you know, uh, recommendations, feel free to also drop those in the comments below too. Peace.